This episode of The Imperfects contains a discussion on eating disorders. The stories shared in this episode are unique to the people who have experienced them, and we want to acknowledge that eating disorders can present in lots of different ways, in different people. If this topic brings up some concerns for you, we strongly recommend reaching out to the Butterfly Foundation or Eating Disorders Families Australia. My name's Ryan Shelton. I'm a co-host on The Imperfects, the Jewish grandson of Austrian and English immigrants, and I grew up on and am now currently living on Wurundjeri country. I'd like to recognise the traditional peoples of this continent whose land was stolen nearly 250 years ago. In particular, we at The Imperfects would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast was recorded, and we extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The rich storytelling history of the world's oldest living culture is what we proudly pay homage to when we share stories on The Imperfects. We're all imperfect, and on this podcast, I'll be chatting with a variety of interesting people who are willing to make themselves vulnerable by sharing their own struggles and imperfections. Then, we'll discuss the invaluable takeaways we can all apply to our own imperfect lives. I'm Hugh Van Kylenberg from The Resilience Project. And I'm Ryan Shelton from My Mum. And I'm Josh from Hugh's Mum. And this is The Imperfects. Part two. Part deux. Part deux is the French. Un, deux, trois, quatre. Yeah, yeah deux. Yeah, deux. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't need to go any further. Deux. Part deux. Yeah. Uh, if you, if you hopefully have listened to the first part with Kate Reid, um, which, which we put out last week, but um, this, is, this is part two. It was such, such a big story, we couldn't fit it into one episode. Yep, that's and, right. And now, how, how, are you, how are you guys, though? How are you guys going? Uh, I'm good. I'm very, very mm. relaxed. I'm in Perth on holiday with the family, just spending time on the beach, Lovely. making sandcastles and... Having nice food, it couldn't be better. Do the kids um, get involved in the sandcastles or is it? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, well, I'll start making a sandcastle with Charlie. He loses interest about yeah. 30 seconds later and I'll be going for another 10 minutes and then he comes and stomps <laughs> on them and smashes them and it's very hard <laughs> for me cry. to just, just go, no, nah, it's fine. That's just part of, <laughs> part of sandcastles. <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually was I was away with my niece and nephew recently and we entered a sandcastle competition. Really? Uh, up in Palm Cove. Did you beat her? <laughs> we were a team. We were on the same okay. team. And the plan was we'd do a pizza, a, a massive pizza in a pizza box. That was going to be our, oh, yeah. you know, that was going to be yeah. our design. And no one else showed up. So we were the only ones competing, quote unquote, in the sandcast competition. We won. But uh, yes, same same sort of thing. They lost interest. And I was like, no, we will do this properly and we'll do it well. <laughs> I had so much pride in that pizza box. You good, Hugh? No, I just feel like Josh has put so much. I was just going to give you a token. Yeah, fine. But yeah. Josh has really answered the question. With a bit of, I feel like I need to give detail. How do I feel today? How, uh, oh, okay. I, I feel humble. You feel, I feel humble? I feel humble, oh. yeah. Yeah. Why is I had, a, that? I had a humbling, a humbling experience the other night. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that I haven't quite got over. <laughs> okay, sounds like some juicy content to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went. I, as you both know, I'm uh, Amazon Prime and making a special out of my out of my show that I do. Yes, that's yeah. very exciting. Yes, big deal. Well, funny you say big deal. I'm not sure I'm a big deal. <laughs> I don't think that's what Josh was saying. Oh. <laughs> I was saying it's a big deal. He just said it's a big deal. And I, and I, I don't think I'm a big deal, mate, but thank you. No. <laughs> I was saying yeah. funny, what I, what I should have said was funny you say the word big deal because I'm yeah. not a big deal. Yeah. So Amazon <laughs> Prime Video had a had a launch in Sydney for all the shows that they're premiering next year, all the new shows. Yep, yep. There's some really massive shows happening with some really big names. Mm. And I didn't quite know what the night was, but I just was told it's a good thing to go to. I need to get up on stage and talk about what my show is going to be next year. Mm. I was, yeah, that's fine. Like public speaking is my job, so it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, they put you in a really nice hotel in the CBD and they said, there's a car waiting for you and um, it'll pick you up at five. Hang on, you, you said you weren't a big deal. <laughs> sounds like sounds like they're making a pretty big deal about you. <laughs> well, wait we'll to the next bit. Okay, we get to the venue. It's this beautiful kind of warehouse. Just a, I described it as an incredibly cool place in Sydney. Mm. And we get out, and there's a red carpet. I've never done a red carpet before. I do not know what to do. Hell, and yeah, I hate them. Well, that's yeah, absolute hell, especially for me. Yeah. 
So first of all, Scott Boland, Nathan Lyon, like all those like four photographers going, Lino, Lino, Scotty, photos. Like, and then Dave mm. Hughes turns up and they're going, Hughesy, Hughesy, photo. And they're walking down the red carpet and then there's like Asha Ketty's there. She's got a show. She's done the Wiggles turn up. The Wiggles have got a thing coming out. Yes. And everyone's yelling at them to get photos. All, and I, really, I was like, how do I get in here without going down the red carpet? And there's no other way. Yeah. And this lady from Amazon <laughs> said, Hugh, you're next if you'd like to um, – oh. If you'd like to go in, okay, no worries. <laughs> and I walked down, I walked down the red carpet, and they go, okay, just grab a photo of you, mate. And I didn't, I don't know how to pose the photos. I was watching; they're all doing different poses and moves and stuff. Yeah. And I just went for, like, it was like I've seen the photo. It was like, you know, football photos where they just cross their arms and like, like puff their chest out. For some reason, <laughs> I went for tough. that. Oh yeah. And it was just, just such a – anyway, so yeah. I had my photo taken. I had four different photographers out to these photos in front of the Amazon branding and stuff. I did the same pose for all four of them. And then at the end, this guy goes – I had my photos. This guy goes, uh, sorry, mate, um, who are you? Oh. <laughs> and I went, oh, I'm Hugh. And he goes – he looked back. He had like a notepad. He goes, yeah, sorry, Hugh, uh, Hugh who? And I went, uh, Van Kallenberg. And he goes, ah. Oh. He looked at his list like I wasn't there and he goes, Okay. Good stuff. Thanks, mate. Well, um, <laughs> great. <laughs> Thank you. And I went, oh, God. So everyone's, everyone's watching. Red like, carpets are the worst. So, But they were quite a long way away. So I had to go, hey, Hugh. That's, that's, I'm Hugh. Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway, they take me into this room where there's like canopies and drinks. Canapes. Not canopies. Canopies. <laughs> Can- canop- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Canapes and drinks. And all the people who had shows coming out were in there. So mm. the Wiggles are there. Shaquette's there. Yeah. Tommy Little. Members of the Australian cricket team are there. Joel Creasy's there. Yeah. All these really big names in Australian entertainment. And I'm sort of standing there. And there's some other incredible shows coming out. And there's, there was this huge curtain that separated like the main dining area. But you could see through it from where we're all having our canopies and champagne. Yeah. And a guy, a photographer come out with his like assistant. Mm. And he said, okay, guys, we're getting the real hero shot here just to really celebrate what's happening next year. So we're going to get Wiggles. If you guys could come through here. Um, and he looked around, he goes, um, and we'll get Tommy Little in, through you come, Husey in, oh, mate, so happy you're here, big fan, mm. through you come, Husey. And they're just calling people out like they're picking a cricket team at oh, lunchtime no, in primary horrible. school. Yeah. And they're going, oh, look at this, it's so exciting, all those names into one room. That I definitely know. Yeah, and then everyone just gets called back behind this curtain to have this photo taken. And I could see, and I was like, I'll just, I'll just walk through. I'll save the guy the embarrassment of, yeah. like, oh. of not knowing my name. I'll just walk through and just get into position for this photo for – Oh, anyway, this is amazing. he keeps calling around. He goes, okay, we got the wheels. We got, um, we got Joel Creasy. Okay, good. Good, Asher. Asher Keddy, good. We got you. Um, okay. And he looked at his list and he goes, and I'm literally standing by myself in this room. And he goes, and that's all we need. Uh, cool. <laughs> I'm standing there with champagne. And so everyone, everyone had this photo. And I had to stand by myself <laughs> my champagne. And I made a rule on the way there. I'm not going to look at my phone. Because when you're in situations yeah. and you're unsure of yourself, you check your phone. Of course. I mm. was like, I'm not checking my phone. I'm not checking it. Yeah. I was like, well, this is the ultimate test. I'm standing in a room by myself. I'm just going to just stand here. So I just stood there with a champagne looking into nowhere. And I could see them all in this photo going, oh. And you guys. just didn't join. I wasn't invited. I was, they didn't need me for, the, for like the – but it's like he said, that's all we need. That's all we need. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I stood there by myself. Anyway, all of a sudden I was a bit flat. I was like, oh my yeah. God, I'm a no one. What am I doing? This yeah. ridiculous, massive imposter syndrome. <laughs> and I'm like, just talk to everyone. Just be really friendly. You don't care that you need to invite back to the big photo. And I think Amazon are like, quickly, Amazon people go and chat to Hugh. He's got no one to talk to. This lady comes over to me. She was the nicest lady. And she goes, oh my gosh. Okay. I don't know. You know, I'm such a fan. And I was like, oh good. Someone knows who I am at least. Yeah. And she goes, Josh. I am such a huge fan of yours. <laughs> <laughs> oh my went, God. Yeah, yeah. How are you going? <laughs> nice, to, nice to meet you. That is, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's horrible. Oh. I mean, that brings back so much, tra- so many traumatic memories of the times that I've been on red carpets. It's horrific. I mean, we might cut this out, but I just feel like this is the opportunity to tell my red carpet story. We're not cutting this out. Um, well, it was like at the Logies years ago, and f- I would I would always try and avoid the red carpet, always, because at the Logies at least there's like the you can go two ways. You can go down the red carpet, which takes you past all the photographers, or you can go the back way if you want to avoid all that and just go straight in. I would always go around the back way to avoid all the yeah. – the 
worrying about like, oh, people going to know who I am? Do they care? Where should I be here? <laughs> All that, just to get in there. Anyway, so one year, uh, Hamish and Andy were opening the Lokis. They were like doing the, the, the opening thing. And so they had to, and we would always go together. And so they had to go down the red carpet at the very, very start of the red carpet. And at that time, there's no one, no other people on the red carpet. It's completely empty, right? And so they rock up. You know, they get out of the car or whatever it is. Everyone goes crazy. And it's like then me and then Tim Bartley yeah. as well. And then a few other people who we were working with on those Hamish and Andy shows. And Hames and Andy, they start signing autographs and, you know, start getting photos taken and everything. And the rest of us make our way to go around the back to avoid all the photographers. And as we're going down, uh, the woman uh, who was, oh, her name was Paige. She's a, she, was a produ- she was producing the red carpet. And I knew her from when I was on Rove. She used to work on Rove. So she saw me and, and she was like, oh, Ryan, Ryan, can you please come do some photos? Um, there's n- there, there's, we haven't got anyone. Like, there's no one else to take, to take photos of because Hames and Andy were further down the carpet signing autographs. And so I was like, oh, Paige, like, I really would prefer not to, like trying to keep a low profile. I was like, I, I really just don't want to. I mean, the only reason I don't want to is because I know that no one cares. No one wants to take photos of me. I don't want to have to face that reality. So I always avoid it. And so she's like, please, please, please. We need, you know, we need someone to take photos of. And she's like, do me a favor. I'm like, <sighs> I was like, okay, all right. And so for some reason I say yes. So there is, I, I, I mean it when I say a hundred photographers around the bollards, around the edge of this huge carpet, which is completely empty. I was empty. making me so nervous. Yeah. And then she wa- walks me over to this like huge, and all the photographers, imagine them all with their big cameras, like pointed up, ready to like capture the moment. And then as soon as she goes, hey, everyone, I've got Ryan Shelton from Rove and Hamish and Andy's gap here. And in unison, a hundred <laughs> cameras drop. <laughs> drop down not one person has any interest <laughs> not one of them had a bit of social now to like, go they're they're digital cameras they're digital, digital cameras, cameras. <laughs> yeah there's no it's not film it's like oh we'll save our film it's like that is that's maybe 10 meg not even worth 10 megabytes they all drop their cameras <laughs> as if it was like pre-organized <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay. So I say, Paige, that's all right. I'll just, so I just like put my head down and like powered through. And just as I'm about to get out, I hear Paige go, oh, Ryan, Ryan, there's someone, there's someone. And I turn around and I go over and it's channel 31. It's like, you know, <laughs> the, the, the lovely, lovely, generous people from channel 31 <laughs> did a quick interview with me. And then that was it. And that is why I hate red carpets. <laughs> Horrific. Oh, my God. Horrific. Anyway, oh. um, sorry to... Uh, Literally steal the oh, red carpet spotlight. So good, but so um, good. yeah, let's agree never to do red carpets yep. ever. Yeah, um, done deal. So anyway, part two of yep. Kate Reed. <laughs> this is not about us now. This is about Kate Reed. Hopefully, you've heard the first part of her incredible story. Yeah, so we'll pick up this episode today. Um, Kate had just returned from London because she was struggling so mm. so badly with her her mental illness and her eating disorder. Um, so this is her arriving home and. And her starting loan, but also coinciding with her health starting to pick up again. So you were saying that the thing that really helped you was discovering a passion that you probably cared more about than your weight. Is that kind of yeah. that was not a clunky way of no, summarising it? No, it's not clunky at all. I think it's really accurate. Um, I'd had, I guess, I had discovered the passion. So the day I landed back from the UK, mum and dad took me to the GP and then I saw advertised in the local paper uh, a job ad for Philippa's Bakery in Armadale. They needed a counter hand. And Philippa's I, bread's terrific. Oh, it's, I, their olive Toscano is still one of my favourite loaves of all time. Amazing. I, I always go it. to ciabatta, but yes, I, I have, yep. Well, settle down, you two. <laughs> <laughs> so I think part of me was real, like even now I imagine – going back to uni to like saddle up to like a five-year course and it scares Mm. the absolute, like that that, to me that feels like a terrifying thought because I know what was involved to get through aerospace. Like, I'm not sure all degrees are like aerospace though. I'm not, that might be one of the more (laughs) difficult ones. I don't think aerospace is an arts degree, is it? No. (laughs) (laughs) 
It might be harder than primary <laughs> teaching that I did as well. It might be just a slightly more. Like different. if we had like 40 contact hours a week, uh, so it was a full-time job at university, and then I think we did something like 14 subjects a semester, and then I'd come home and just start studying, and I'd probably study until about 3 a.m. in the morning, and that yeah. was just on the daily for five years. Yeah, I didn't do that. <laughs> 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 we had a subject that went for six months called tessellations, oh. and we just did tessellations. What's tessellations? <laughs> like shapes that will fit next oh. to each other and be on repeat, a repeatable. Oh, that sounds very age. pleasing. Yeah. For a week. I don't know why it was six <laughs> months of a primary. I didn't teach tessellations once at primary school. I recognise them when I see them now because wow. anyway. And you've now got to reference it in this interview, which is fantastic. So maybe it was content. That's why I did it. (laughs) Content. Everything leads to content. Won't be the highlight of this interview either. But anyway, (laughs) um, it won't be the promo part. That's for sure. (laughs) There was there's something. So you started work at at Philippers, but there's something you said before which just it it just made me like just so happy. This. So you said um, when you were baking at home and you brought the things in and you saw how happy. It made people. I mean, to me, like that's that's everything. Yep. Like, th- like that is no matter whether you're baking or doing whatever. But like, what else is there that it's like the thing that whatever you do that you can do it to see like directly. Yep. You've made something. You hand it over, and you bring this like joy. You've just summed up pretty much what I exist for and why Loon exists. I mean, yep. that, I mean that's that's purpose. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you go from Philippers. Well, so I took the job at Philippers because I was petrified about committing to, like, I, I knew that I wanted to explore being a pastry chef or a baker, but the thought of going back to school mm, and studying okay. to maybe also discover that it's not what I wanted at the end of it again, I think I was a bit gun shy, and I thought, okay, instead of going and studying, I'm just going to get a job in a bakery, working as a counterhand and just see if I like it. Mm. So it's a bit like a trial. Mm. And I absolutely loved it, but A, I was still very sick. So I didn't have, like there were long days at the bakery on my feet and um, I probably wasn't physically up to it. The only, like I loved it, the only thing that made me sad was that I wasn't making the the things that we were selling that were making people happy. Mm. And so that was enough of an indication to me that I wanted to go down that path. And at the time, still living with mum and dad, there was this tiny little cafe near their house in Hartwell in Melbourne Southeast. And on my days off, I would walk to this cafe and just sit and have a coffee. I think it had like 12 seats in it, but it was, it was literally like something out of, you know, Chocolat, the movie, like mm. this perfect little space that didn't belong in the neighbourhood. And it was owned by this couple, Mary, who was a chef, and her husband, Al, who was a plumber. But Al knew how much, how passionate Mary was about this cafe and about making the type of food that she wanted to. So he'd gone over to, I think it was uh, Genovese at the time, and learned how to make coffee and he gave up his plumbing job and was just her full-time barista so he could support her in the business. Like beautiful couple, beautiful. What a story. I and love it. Yeah. Wow. So I'd go there and have my coffee and one day I plucked up the courage. I went up to Mary and I said, actually, this is – it is an emotional story, but I that this is going to get me. Yeah. Um, I went up and I said to her, Mary, is there any chance that you'd hire me to do your baking for you? Because she had almost an Otto Lenghi style counter before Otto Lenghi made that famous, like these like tiered, you know, tarts and cakes and, and biscuits that were very Mediterranean inspired. And she said, yes, darling, of course I will. Uh, you can start next week. It'll be Tuesday to Sunday. You'll just do four hours from 6.30 to 10.30 and do the baked goods for the counter and then you're going to go home. And suddenly I actually had, oh. like someone had entrusted me with a KitchenAid professionally and they were going to let me bake. And I probably entered into maybe one of like the most beautiful, happy, supportive times in my career prior to having my own business where I would leap out of bed every morning and walk over to this cafe and do Mary's baking and her and Al would come in half an hour after I got there and she'd start preparing all this beautiful Mediterranean, like her family were from Constantinople. So her food was very like Turkish inspired, but also Greek and Moroccan. And and she also had an affinity for French food. She'd do beautiful like quiches and French tarts. And I learned so much from her where I started to really build up my, like 
maybe this is where it started that uh, getting out of bed wasn't to weigh myself and plan my eating. Mm. Like getting out of bed was I had a purpose mm. and something that I loved and people that made me happy to be around and yeah, I, I had a purpose again. That the moment where you ask Mary if she would if she would hire you yeah. to to do the baking is like the like that was that were you nervous to ask her that or was I mean you're obviously an ambitious kind person of never but, been nervous to ask yeah, like the okay. worst someone's going to say is no I feel like yeah my entire career has has happened because I've been brave enough to ask mm -hmm. and along the way enough people have said yes. Mm -hmm. Do you say that was a thing that was going to get you emotionally because oh. you think that's the point that you started to recover? No. Um, maybe a year after that, uh, I I got sick. I got I dipped again in my recovery and I had to cut back my hours and I was very nervous and I asked to have a meeting with Mary. So I went over after service one day and she sat down with me. I'm like, Mary, I think I'm going to have to cut back my days. I just don't have enough energy and I'm slipping and she didn't, I had never spoken to her about having an eating disorder. And, and at, at this point in time, I hadn't made any specific reference to it either. And she said, darling, the first time you walked in that door, I knew what you were suffering from. And I wanted to give you the job to give you a really supportive environment to learn and flourish in. And she said, you work the hours you can work, we'll always be here for you. Mm. So yeah. Wow. My gosh. Very lucky. Yep. Yeah. I owe Mary a lot. But the story is nice because I'd, I'd started to, you know, have a purpose to my day and I'd, I was loving doing this baking for her, but I think the, the, the way my brain works, I wanted something a bit more complex and a bit more challenging. And I was starting to get interested in French pastry and I'd ordered on Amazon this book about French patisseries. So it was a combination of featuring some of the best patisseries in Paris and then also recipes from products that appear in those patisseries. And I got home from work at the cafe one day and the book had arrived and I was still at mum and dad's house. I sat down on the lounge room floor and unwrapped it and randomly opened it up to this double page photo of Pan au Chocolat stacked up. And it was really zoomed in and you could see every single perfect layer of the these like intricate viennoiserie. I was so mesmerized. Viennoiserie. Yeah, viennoiserie is the family that croissants belong. So wow. yeah. Yeah. How would you pronounce that, Hugh? Von Wasery. <laughs> <laughs> I love Von Wasery. Yeah, very good. <laughs> very good. Ah, Vion, Vion Wasery. Yeah, Vien Wasery. Vien like, Wasery. It comes from Viennese. Ah, so, right. yeah, the origin of the croissant is actually Austrian. Oh. oh. Yep. Well, yeah. well, well. Yeah. Vien Wasery. Vien Wasery. <laughs> That's amazing. The yep. French have just been getting all this credit. Well, I think it was Marie Antoinette uh, when she married into the French royal family. She brought her Austrian pastry chef with her and they make something called a kipferl, which is crescent shapped. Mm -hmm. Like the, I think it's something to do with the, uh, the Austrian flag having the moon on it or the crescent. Oh, oh, right. And then it kind of, it, it evolved into the croissant from there. So, so because you still do see sometimes the crescent shaped croissant. Oh yeah. Um, there's a good tip on them. Oh. In France, if you're, if, like, you know how a lot of croissants, I'm going to say it the Australian yeah, way, yeah. croissants are straight, but then there yep. are some that are crescent. Mm -hmm. In France, you're only allowed to shape your croissants straight if they're made with pure butter. The crescent-shaped ones are made with vegetable fat or margarine. So it's a good tip and if you're in a, France. that's a law. It's a law. Incredible. <laughs> I love French laws like that. That's amazing. Yeah. I picture someone's job is going around to cafes and checking, like people in Australia check for liquor license. Yeah. They just grab one and go, hang on a minute. This is margarine. <laughs> that's like there's a law. Isn't there a law in Australia you're only allowed to sell sausages in bread if you have a Bunnings? <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, I think that's the law. I think, I think that's the law. I hope that's the law. That's brilliant. <laughs> I don't know if it is officially, but they're definitely trying to push it through Parliament. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Fingers uh, crossed. Watch Bunnies this space. Happy yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. So, where were we now? I oh, forgot. Oh, so Viennoiserie. And, yeah, yes, Viennoiserie. Yes, sorry, yeah. 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 So, I was so inspired by this photo that mm. I literally closed the book, walked up to flight centre in Camberwell, and booked myself a ticket to Paris. Oh. And I got to work the next day and I was telling Mary this story and she's like, 
oh my God, I've never been to Paris. I'm coming with you. The movie. This is a movie. I was thinking that before. <laughs> this is a movie. Oh my God. Okay. Anyway, yeah. her husband, Al, for a couple of weeks was really grumpy. Oh, so that, that day after work, we went up to Flight Centre and booked Mary's ticket to Paris. And Al was really grumpy. And after a couple of weeks, Mary, Mary and I were like, What's going on, Al? Like, you've been in a bad mood. He's like, well, no one asked if I wanted to come to Paris. Oh, God. So, oh God. so we went and booked his ticket. <laughs> I'm writing the script in my head. <laughs> Real time. Yeah. Who's so going to play Mary? I'll give it a go. <laughs> Grid girl one day. Yeah. Yep. Why not? <laughs> Sorry, Kate. Love um, this theme. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, that September, we all headed off to Paris together. And we were planning to spend a week in Paris and then three weeks travelling around the French countryside. So, you know, we were sharing an Airbnb for six days. We'd walked around Paris nonstop together, having all our meals. Al pulled me aside on the sixth night and he's like, look, Mary's birthday coming up and I'd really like to just treat her to one day in Paris. Do you mind if we have the day to ourselves? I was like, I was kind of like waiting for it. I mean, you don't need your third wheel hanging around in Paris with you the whole time. (laughs) So how old are they again? Uh, She... Would have been, I think she was turning 40. So she's okay. my age yeah. now. Okay, yeah. Um, so I was like, that's cool. I'm actually quite excited to have a day to explore Paris by myself. And I woke up that morning and thought, oh, I really want to go to the boulangerie where that photo was taken that made me book the trip. So we were staying in the 6th in Saint Germain and I walked over to Canal Saint Martin in the 10th to Dupin et Desidé uh, where the photo had been taken. And it's, have you have you been? Uh, a, a little bit. Like I've been for like two days, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. Did you I've go been. to Dupin? I don't think so. It's it's that. I saw the tower. Se- the tower. I saw the tower. Saw the arch. Saw. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see much. Had some snails. Had some snails. Had a croissant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I don't know Paris very well at all. That sounds okay. like Mr. Chicken's um, <laughs> trip to. Do you guys know Mr. Chicken? Okay, no, it's a kids' book. Don't worry. <laughs> It's fantastic. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Chicken goes to France and oh, he's, yeah. he's not a he's a chicken, but he's a, he's the size of this room. Oh. He's huge. He's a big he's, boy. He's huge and he doesn't fit on the plane. Like True he's, story? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he eats so much pastry and everything's about him eating so much they can't fit him on the plane. So they strap him to the roof of the plane and he flies home on the roof of the plane. Everyone's happy. So, wow. Anyway, this, did, did you get strapped to the roof of the plane when you came back? Uh, yeah, I probably should have yeah. been. <laughs> probably should have been, actually, based on what I ate. Yeah. Anyway, that is a terrible diversion. But, but for Mr. Chicken fans out there, you'll oh, I enjoyed that. that diversion so much. Oh, they're going Look nuts to Mr. Chicken fans. <laughs> it is easily it. my favourite book to read, Benji and Elsie, Mr. Chicken's. I love it. Anyway, I, I can hear our producer giggling in the background, so maybe it's not as bad as I thought it was that little bit. <laughs> She's writing down bits we can cut out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, sorry. So, Dupin de Desiree is a quintessential Parisian boulangerie. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's Belle Epoque in its style, so very ornate and elaborate. And this one was had been beautifully restored. You walk in, and it's got like the beautiful mosaic tile ceilings and counters, you know, with brass dividers. And I had stood in the little line waiting to get in and I must have been standing in the shop because the vendeurs or the sales assistant was laughing at me and she said, you've been standing there a while, can I help you? Mm. But said it all in French. And I tried to explain to her in broken French that I'd seen a photo of the boulangerie in a book in Australia and it had prompted me to book a trip to Paris. Mm. And I must not have explained it very well because she went out the back and brought the owner out and she said, he speaks English. Oh. And so Christophe Vasseur, I told him the story in English and he, he was beautiful. He went around and wrapped up several pastries and said, please, like, these are on me. What an amazing story. So I went, this, it does, it's very romantic. I took the pastries and I went and sat on the steps of Sacre Coeur at Montmartre and I nibbled a bit of each. I thought I'd better take some back for Mary and Al and tell them this great story. So I'd been blown away by the experience of this bakery and notice I swapped from boulangerie to bakery because I was worried about starting oh, right. to sound a bit like... No, boulangerie. I, I, yeah, I think everyone knows boulangerie, bakery. I didn't know. I just thought it was the name of the bakery. Oh, there you go. No, yeah. it's the word for bakery in, in French, boulangerie. Okay. Mm. I've got Boulangerie's to delight. Yeah, it's, got, it's not a chain. Okay. I've got to get better at saying <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about to people. Sometimes I, just, I don't <laughs> want to look dumb, so I go... Call it oh, out. Oh, boulangerie, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I got that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. So the next day we jumped on a train and went down to the Dordogne and checked into Sorry, what's that? Oh, the the Dordogne? Is that like how how I do don't you, know what the Dordogne It's it's like southwest France. Oh, it's okay. A place. okay, it's a place. Okay, it's yeah, where yeah. Chocolat was filmed. Oh ah, nice, okay, yeah. yeah. 
So we checked into our hotel and I'm going back to the era of no smartphones and having an internet room in the hotel where there's like one yes. computer with dial-up internet and you'd go down there and check your hotmail. Yeah, the business centre. The business centre. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Does this hotel have a business centre? Good, because I'll be doing my business there tomorrow. <laughs> it's always a computer with a petition up. Yeah, yeah that's it. and a boardroom with a conference phone that's never been used. This was not that fancy. <laughs> right, okay. It was an old computer in uh, a small room. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, so you jumped on. Well, I'd been thinking about the experience of going to this bakery while I was on the train and how, touching back on it, I was really touched by how happy the pastries had made me feel and even the experience of walking into that space and being surrounded by such beauty, like not just visually but like the scent of it and and the little line of people waiting. was. I was like, every day this guy gets to make people feel happy, even mm. if it's only for 10 minutes when they're eating their pastry. Like what a gift to be able to give someone mm. to produce something so seemingly simple and like it's not changing the world in a big way, but if every day you can make someone feel happy for 10 minutes, what a gift. Yeah. And so I sat down at the computer and I wrote this email to him just thanking him so much for the pastries and saying how touched I'd been by the experience and how amazing it was that he got to make, you know, several hundred people feel so happy every day. Mm. And he wrote back, it was like on the contact form on the on the website. Yeah. And he wrote back to me quite quickly and said, oh, um, this email means a lot to me. I do feel very blessed that this is my job. And I kind of, without thinking, fired an email back to him. Good old Kate uh, asking. I was just going to say, ask. I bet you're about to ask for a job. Yeah. Yeah. I said, oh, look, um, I don't suppose you would ever consider taking me on as an apprentice. And he wrote back well, you don't speak French and we only have French speaking people and it's a very small bakery, but for some reason I can see the same passion and motivation in you that is in me. When do you want to start? <sighs> so, yeah. yeah. And when did you start? Like six months later, I was back on a plane to Paris. Wow. And ha and so that's a big change in lifestyle. So ha where were you on your recovery and your eating disorder at, at that point? Like where were you? Look, I was probably well enough, like I was, I was, eating without needing to have someone watching me to make sure I was eating. Mm -hmm. And I think working at the cafe with Mary and Al had been really good for me in that because it made me feel excited about food again and I trusted Mary's cooking. And so this was like a new thing for me that I was happy to eat somebody else's food. But like she'd go to the Queen Vic markets, you know, oh, oh, it must have been a Tuesday because I don't think they're open on a Monday, but and procure everything fresh and she worked very seasonally. And I just see her come in on a Tuesday morning with this bounty of beautiful fruit and mm. vegetables and then turn them into some of the most delicious food I've ever eaten. Like she made me love food again and she made me trust eating it from somebody else. So by the time I headed off to Paris by myself, I was starting to form a healthier relationship with food and I remembered how much I loved it. So I still probably wasn't the healthiest weight, but my mindset was healthier. Mm. Yeah. So my, there were long days at the at the bakery. Um, I actually went over there initially. We, we'd agreed that I would do a three-month stage. A stage is an unpaid period of time typically in the hospitality industry. And then if, um, if Christoph thought that I was progressing the way I should be uh, and I was still interested in learning more, then we would turn it into a full apprenticeship, which is typically a couple of years in Paris. And is, is this this boulangerie is uh, were they are they at the time at least well known as a very like respected bakery? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. I think probably would have been classified one of the best boulangeries in Paris. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, actually, a sidestep, but mm. um, the head pastry chef Sebastian absolutely hated me. Like I was this like upstart engineer who had decided that she wanted to change her career to be a pastry chef. Ah, uh, right. I yeah. didn't speak French. You didn't You didn't follow the correct route. No, like yeah. he had probably apprenticed since he was maybe 14 years mm. old and had been working his whole life. And here I was getting to work in his kitchen. Yeah. And he just wouldn't have a bar of me. Mm -hmm. But there was, there was two raw pastry chefs and then we worked on the first floor and then everybody else was bakers. So we would do all the raw pastry work and then it would get sent downstairs to be proven and baked. The other pastry chef that worked under Sebast Sebastian was uh, a Korean girl called Yoongi. 
And she was my saving grace. And she spoke no English and I spoke no Korean. So we just communicated through the most broken French, but everything I learned when I was there, I learned from her. Mm. And she was incredibly generous with her knowledge and patient with me. So much so that I think I came back from Paris speaking French with a Korean accent. Oh, wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. So Which you... I'm really devastated I haven't maintained. So but can you st- do you still speak French? Oh, a very little bit. Like okay. I could walk into a store and order something. Mm. I couldn't have a complex discussion. Yeah, okay. So you're at the boulangerie and you're learning, you're speaking French in a Korean accent and... <laughs> What what does your your fascination and love of of like French pastries or Austrian pastries <laughs> uh, does it like grow or does it stay? Big time. I've found my thing. So so what is it about? Because obviously there's the part of it where you make something and make someone happy, but I mean I feel like we're getting to the the the, the as you mentioned your perfectionist you know your like obsession with perfectionism. Which is just, I mean, fascinating. I feel like this is going to be a two-part episode. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but was that what kind of really drew you to it as far as like the trial and error that you learned at Williams and the F1 experience? And it, was that all part of it? Yeah. Like also making croissants isn't like making a batch of muffins or a cake. It's a three-day process that has so many variables. And I think understanding a variable is a very engineering thing. Like- if you're, if you're trying to improve something, you can only change one variable at a time because if you change mm. two and the end result is different, you have no idea which mm. variable made the difference. Yeah. So looking at the process of three days, the, the first day being making the dough and then it having a long, slow 24-hour fermentation uh, at fridge temperature, mm-hmm. the second day being the, the very complex part of creating the lamination or the layers of dough and butter in the pastry and shaping it, and then the third day being the proving and baking – there are so many variables in that that you could analyse, improve, innovate to improve that end end pastry that I just became captivated by the science and the and the intricacy behind yeah. the creation of a croissant. But so with, within this boulangerie, though, I imagine they had a very strict process of this is how you do our croissant. Uh, the, yeah, there was no room to for, move. Well, not ro- no room for a stagiaire to oh, impact yeah. Head Chef Sebastian's process, but Head Chef Sebastian's process was the one that had been passed down to him that like it was like a master baker to a master baker. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I don't think there was any room for yep. adjustment or improvement. It was this is how we do it. Yep. And we'll do it like this every single With day. With this particular butter, this amount of time in the oven, all the Correct. very specific things. I, sh- I should be clear. I only spent a month at that boulangerie. Okay, right. And I was working for a guy called Nathan Tolman, who's now one of my business partners at Loon, mm. at a cafe called Three Bags Full in Abbotsford. Oh, when wow. I, Yeah. Yes, I know it really well. Yeah. yeah. Mm. When I went to Paris, but I took that job at Three Bags and knowing that I was going to Paris. And I think Nathan was like, that's great. She's going to go over and learn some new stuff that she can bring back. But while I was in Paris, Nathan reached out to me and said, we're expanding three bags full. It would be great if we could have you back to fill out the team. So I think at this point I'd been at the boulangerie for a month and because I wasn't getting paid a salary, at some point in time you have to assess whether you can afford to live or not. And I was living in Le Marais, like one of the most Mm. expensive central parts of Paris, Mm. having an incredible experience like – and it wasn't just learning about viennoiserie. It was every part of me was challenged. Like it was such a physical job uh, trying to pick up new skills in a language that wasn't my own. Like I w- I w- I've never slept so well in my life. Like I'd come home from a day at Dupin and I was exhausted physically and mentally but so fulfilled. Mm. So And like learning this new process that I, I could see the potential in – perfecting every single part of it and the joy and satisfaction personally that I would get in producing something, knowing that I'd perfected every stage of it. Uh, so I, I ended up leaving the boulangerie after a month thinking, I know how to make croissants now. Mm-hmm. Learning the first time I tipped the dough out on the bench at Loon when I was testing croissants that I didn't know how to do anything after making the dough. And oh. I was missing maybe like 90% of the information. Yeah. 
Right. Because Sebastian had never let me use the laminator. Mm-hmm. He'd never let me mark and cut a batch of croissants. I'd begged him to let me roll croissants. But apart from making the dough and rolling a croissant, I had almost none of the knowledge. I feel wow. like I've just – have I skipped ahead there? Well, a little bit. But, I mean, there's, there's, I guess there's a step where you decide to start loan. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So that's, that's a pretty big it's one. Pretty crucial that's one. Small bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge part. How did, so you've you've gone. I'm so passionate about this. I'm going to start my own thing. Well, when I came back to Australia and was working at Three Bags Full, I'd had this experience of living in Paris, and you know, on my days off in Paris, I would go to different boulangeries and try their croissants, and that became the thing that I did when I came back to Australia. Like I found myself gravitating towards this particular pastry. And I was determined to find a croissant in Melbourne that came close to the beautiful ones that I'd had in Paris. And it became like this dogged mission. I would, I was having, like, I would try, I, I reckon I tried every bakery in Melbourne and I couldn't find a good one that came anywhere near what I'd experienced in Paris. And like, we're going back, you know, 12 years now. Honestly, it is really, really hard to do amazing bread and amazing pastries because the environment required is so different and the skill set required is so different. I found Mm. you would either see a bakery that had amazing bread and average pastries or the opposite or everything was average. Yeah. I I just love how your brain has kind of made that assessment of of that situation, like your your background, your training, your precision and your – I guess your grounding in Formula One is looking at conditions and yeah. how to make something. Mm. The, the conditions required, the variables required to make something perfect that doesn't work for both bread and pastry, which no. is, I find fascinating. So I think in Australia at that time, I think croissants were a token item that most and and like this is this is very generalised because. I like I know a couple of incredible bakers out there that were doing really good croissants, but they still didn't to me match up what I'd experienced in Paris because they had a full bakery. Mm-hmm. And I think having it as a token item on the counter is like we're a bakery, we're expected to sell croissants. We're going to do it the tried and tested way that you know people have done for generations, and we'll slap it on the counter, and it'll be good enough. And maybe that's the thing; it'll be good enough. But for me, nothing's ever I, – I don't do anything to just be good enough. Like if yeah. I do something, I want to be the absolute best I'm at picturing it. you like at, at William saying, this bit of the tail, let's just, let's just make it good enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'll be fine. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not going to happen. Just needs more butter. <laughs> <laughs> make it a bit more slippery through the air. Yeah. yeah. So I think I, I did do trials at a few bakeries to potentially do an apprenticeship because I wanted to carry on my learning. And eventually all the trials that I did at bakeries, I thought, oh, I don't want to work at this place. I don't like how they're doing it. Or mm. it, it certainly wasn't to the level of detail that I'd been doing it at Dupin mm. in Paris. And eventually I thought one of the best things about Melbourne is our coffee. Like I, to this day, I still think no one in the world does coffee mm-hmm. like to the consistent level that we do in Melbourne. And we're blessed with incredible espresso bars. Like I could name half a dozen off the top of my head, but – at that at that point in time, Patricia was coming onto the scene, everyday coffee. I'm like, I want to go to these places and have an amazing Melbourne coffee with an amazing croissant. And I want to replicate I mean, Paris coffee wasn't great. Yep. Or especially in bakeries. Mm. And it's different now. Mm. But um I want to be able to sit down in Melbourne and have this perfect like for me, that's a perfect breakfast. Yeah. Like delicious flat white, perfect traditional croissant fresh out of the oven. I'm like, I could do that. I could make the croissants, I could reach out to espresso bars and I could create a little wholesale business that that puts that perfect scenario for me in cafes in Melbourne. You can't see it, so you create it. Yeah. 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 And it kicked Which off. Which is huge, by the way. I mean, not many people, a lot of people could fantasise about that, but to actually go and do it is huge. And so it probably didn't feel like it It's also you, pretty, but- like, not, like it's, I was very ignorant at the time. And I think maybe if you if you were fully aware of everything that it would take, we wouldn't do anything. But if you go in <laughs> with blind faith and optimism, yeah. wonderful stuff happens. Yeah. Yeah. So I spent all my life savings um on I found a tiny little store in Elwood that it didn't really matter where I was located because I was planning to be a wholesale business. Mm. 
and the rent was right and it had a little mezzanine level that I could live in above it. And it was literally just, it was t- it was 20 square metres up and down and I had a mezzanine with a simple bathroom, slept up there and I'd just live between the two floors and the only time I'd really get out of the house was to do the deliveries and that was like my social interaction. But uh, yeah, I spent my life savings, bought the bakery equipment, set it up, recipe tested for about three months and recipe testing for me wasn't, hey, let's take everything I learned in Paris and do it here. It was like, okay, I need to figure out how to do this because I only learned 10% of the process. Yeah, and how and how do my croissants perform in a wind tunnel? Well, <laughs> that was the next step. Yeah. So then I bought the shop next door, established a wind tunnel. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Got to know. Full scale, rolling road, put little wheels on the croissants. 200% yep. though. So you wanted like a bigger croissant. <laughs> Um, so, yes. Okay. So, because I remember, you know, I, I mean, I've grown up in, well, we both have grown up in Melbourne, but I, I remember Loon in Elwood. Yeah. And it was, it was mythical. Yeah. Like the, the, when it was, when it started, it was almost like, and the, like you say, like at the time, if you want a croissant, you go to Baker's Delight or Brumbies. Yep. Like the, that was back then. I mean, I, I'm sure there are other places, like you say, but there wasn't it wasn't easily accessible to get like beautiful pastries from what I knew. And the fact that there was this person selling croissants in this small little place. And if you want one, because you're only selling like a day a week when you're on the So this was, this was when Cam joined. Ah, right. So I did wholesale for 18 months, but uh, I really, like I was working like 100 hours a week. Like I thought Formula One was hard. Yeah. Like try standing in a kitchen by yourself or – By myself for most of it, bless mum, she'd like, she worked at a school for children with disabilities and she'd finish up at 3.30 and drive down to Elwood and she'd like help me with anything that she could. And like even just having her presence, company and support was like a shining light in my day Mm. because I'd been up since like 4am baking and delivering. And then dad would sometimes come down and and he'd like clean up the kitchen while I went to do the deliveries and I'd come back and ready to start my day again with it. Like mum and dad, they're like... Amazing. They're the best ever. Like I met them at the well. Oh yeah, you did too at the Grand Prix. Prix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so at that stage in those eighteen months, sort of before you started selling them to like people lining up, was that at that stage what you would consider like a successful business? Was it doing well? Was it? it I mean, front facing, it was incredibly successful. Like I couldn't keep up with the demand of cafes who wanted to then stock my pastries, mm. and my days were just getting longer and longer and more unmanageable. And like maybe I felt like, because when you've suffered from a mental illness, I think you're so much more aware of yourself. You can feel when it's starting to come on again. And I could feel it was coming on. So I about 15 months in, I closed Loon for two weeks. I told all my customers that I wasn't going to be supplying and I booked a trip back to Paris because I wanted to go back to where it all started for me. And a couple of really good friends of mine who are French, had, that, but they'd lived in Melbourne working in cafes. They'd gone back and opened a cafe called Holly Belly mm-hmm. or they were getting ready to open it. So I was there in like the two weeks in the lead up to opening. And I was so inspired by this dream that they had to take an Australian style cafe and open it in Paris that I said to my friend Nico, I think I'm just going to stop Loon and maybe I'll come and work for you. And he was like, oh my God, don't do that. <laughs> Go back to Australia and keep going with Loon because it's really amazing. Thank you to that person. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I'd met a girl on the plane on the way over and a, a girl from Melbourne. And when we both got back, she invited me to the Wheeler Centre to hear Rene Redzepi talk about his latest book that he'd released, um, which had a special edition to it, a journal. So Rene Redzepi, the chef of Noma. Yes, that's yes, correct. In, in Copenhagen? Copenhagen. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, the, the journal detailed his experience of being voted best restaurant in the world, in the world's 50 best awards, and how it had been one of the most difficult years of his life because Noma was a business that he'd opened to have unbridled creativity with food and really push the experience of dining out for people. So it was very experimental. Mm. But then when he was voted best restaurant in the world, he started to get a different clientele booking, like people that were doing like world cruises and they wanted to Mm. eat at all the three Michelin starred restaurants. And they had a different expectation of fine dining. And that wasn't eating live ants curing raw beef. You know, they they wanted classic French style food. And it placed an awful lot of stress on the team at Noma because they were trying to meet the expectations of these people 
where they weren't actually fulfilling their mm. own desire as chefs of Noma to be creative and experimental. This is a, it's such a tough, this, oh. I mean, I'm fascinated by this area because this is like, I mean, a lot of people now call it um, kind of artistry versus the algorithm. Yep. So it's like, oh, yeah. you know, as, a, as, an, as an artist or, you know, whether it be in food or in anything, when you're creating something and it's like pure creativity and you just, you just make whatever you want to make. But then as soon as you get a hint of success, exactly like what happened to Rene Redzepi, I guess, and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe yourself, but lot happens to lots of artists who become popular or, or commercially successful in some way, that then the pressure to retain the audience or build the audience means that you maybe second guess yourself mm -hmm. as far as your creativity. It's a really, it's a tricky thing. It's fascinating. Well, this talk that he gave was so inspiring. Like he said he had to really dig deep and he said he developed depression, but he had to dig deep and figure out how to get the creativity and the spark back into the team at Noma. Wow. And he spoke about different techniques that he used and, and ideas that, no, but actually got back to being what it was and then again was voted best restaurant in the world being the restaurant that he wanted rather than the algorithm. That's so interesting. So wow. I left that talk and Cam, my brother, had previous, recently sold a cafe that he'd owned with a couple of friends in Port Melbourne and he was on a motorbike trip up the east coast of Australia and at like 10 o'clock at night I call him, I'm like, Cam, I want to turn Loon from a little wholesale croissant supply business into just a customer facing retail like i'm not getting to see the the end customer enjoy mm. oh, what yeah. i've made yeah. and also i'm starting to feel constrained by like i wasn't making exactly what i wanted i was making what the different cafes were ordering and they'd say to me like we want 10 plain croissants five ham cheese 10 danish but like i was starting to feel like there's more potential with this pastry than just the classics. I I want ultimate creativity with my pastry and I want to see people enjoying eating it. And Cam's like, oh, yeah, like I'll be back in a couple of weeks. We can have a talk. I'll come on board and help you out for a bit. Mm. So bless him, came on board. I think within a couple of weeks of opening the tiny little storefront, people were just starting to queue earlier and earlier like the first time we opened, there were a couple of people milling out the front. And then the next weekend when we opened the door at 8 a.m., there was maybe 10 or 15 people waiting. And then the next weekend there was people waiting from 7 a.m. The greatest shock, though, was we, we got down there one morning at about 5 and there was a guy waiting out the front and he, was, he had an iPad. And we're like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm waiting for Loon to open. And wow. this was maybe a couple of months in. And at that point, I think Cam was like, Oh yeah, no, we're on to something here. So I, he, in your movie, Ryan, can I play that guy? I've always yes. wanted to be in a movie. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I'll bring my iPad. And I can do that. I reckon. That reminds me of like the one and only time that my family had a garage sale, and when we like be like. Like an hour before we were going to open, there's like a, a guy hanging out the front waiting, waiting for us to open that garage. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, mate, get your expectations down. Just calm down. <laughs> Some old Super Nintendo games, but they're not good ones. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, that was at five in the morning, and I guess that was a moment where you thought, "This, we're on here." Yeah. And Cam thought, "This is not the two weeks of help yes. that I thought it was going to be." No, and like, like, kudos to him. He'd. Cam's been in hospitality his entire life. He's a hospitality professional. Uh, he opened one of the first small bars in Sydney back in, I think, about 2008 and then sold that and got into the cafe. But I think he was looking to get back into more nighttime, like bar. And he probably thought, yeah, that, cool, this like little bakery business of my sister's. But he's also got a lot of business acumen and I think very quickly saw the potential in the business. Mm. And like without Cam, there's <laughs> – sorry. It's okay. There is no way Loon would be what it is now. Amazing. Yeah. He's a – he's – oh, my God, we fight sometimes, but he's my brother and I love him and he's such a good egg. Yeah. Yeah. So um, – Actually, I'd like to play Cam in the movie if that's okay. <laughs> You can't be Cam and the iPad guy. No, I was just thinking Cam sounds like a much more important. But no, I couldn't. I, I'm not a good actor. I'll be the iPad guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you should be happy with the iPad guy. Yeah, <laughs> Look, he features every weekend because he just he he started lining up every Saturday, Sunday morning. Okay, 
Yep. So we were open okay. Friday, Saturday, Sundays, and it got to the point where people would start queuing. Like we'd get – because we had to start working earlier and earlier because we were figuring out how to make more and then we were being more creative with the pastry. So we would kind of get down there at like 3.30 in the morning and there were already a few people lined up every, like every Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And it, it became, I mean, like I kind of lived in that area and it became- It was mythical. It like, was. People would talk about it. It's like, if you you know, if you want one of those croissants, you've got to get there really early. It and is. People so, would go with boxes. It's also, and, it's also not fair that Josh isn't here because oh, I'm yeah. not sure anyone has sampled more loon oh, than Oh, bless Josh. him. He I'm going to have to drop some around. He is. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, same, same. Yeah, I um, I also love it as well. So, yeah, yeah you can drop some at mine as okay, well. Okay, deal. Yeah. <laughs> but Josh loves loon so much and I'm disappointed oh, sorry, he's missing Josh. out on meeting you. Oh, anyway, he's your brother. He is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So we had these crazy early queues. Uh, we probably, we had a ticket system. So because <laughs> this great guy called Ian Turner, who was a surgeon that worked, I think, at, uh, at one of the hospitals in the eastern suburbs, he would come off night shift and on the, in the early days and he'd line up and get his croissants. And then one day we got this pretty impassioned email from him saying, they're the best croissants I've ever had. I love them, but I can't come and get them from you guys anymore because I've started to miss out because people are line jumping and you don't know about it. He's like, oh. you know, three people might be in front of me, but just before eight o'clock when you open, like a maxi taxi shows up and eight of their friends pile out. And he's like, by the time it gets to me in the queue, there's nothing left. And he's oh, like, I'm wasting horrible. my time. Yeah. So we invented the Ian Turner ticketing system. <laughs> <laughs> and at 6.30, we'd open the window with a raffle book. Like I'd be baking, Cam would do this and you'd ha- you had to line up and then one raffle ticket entitled you to six croissants and you weren't allowed to leave the line. So if you stepped out of the line, you forfeited your place. Yes. That We had like on, we'd hand out a menu that said what the day's pastries were and on the back it had house rules and it was like, you're not allowed to leave the line, you're only allowed six pastries. It was quite, it was quite strict. That's incredible. Yeah. It was a bit like, I imagine there should have been a Seinfeld episode made yes. around it. It's the croissant Nazi. Yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. I actually... I did walk up to a customer one day who was getting verbally violent with a woman in front of him, and I said, no croissant for you. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> Told him to leave. Oh, amazing. <laughs> and then everyone in the line clapped. Oh, but my favourite line story, yeah. I think it might have been, I don't think it was a federal election, I think it was a state election, deep into the days of the early line. So we're like we're like 3 a.m. people are lining up. 3 a.m.? 3 a.m., by the time we start the ticketing at 6.30, we have 100 people around the block. And, and how many croissants are you selling on a day? We oh, Typically, our capacity was about 500. Mm-hmm. So you do the maths. Like if you're – like everyone would take six pastries as well. Like if you've lined up there for – since three in the morning, you're yeah. buying the maximum yes. possible. Yeah. So we could – we would say like, hang on, I'm going to have to do some quick maths. That's like – 83 tickets were guaranteed and the 84th ticket came and handed over and go, if everyone in the line in front of you buys six pastries, you're not going to get any, just warning you. And often we'd hand out like 20 or 30 tickets beyond the guaranteed and then we would sell out on the 83rd ticket. Like it was, it was wild. And then like someone who missed, you'd see them like third in line the next day. They're like, we're not missing out this time. But my favourite, so state election – this guy, he's, he was maybe like 40th in line, gets to the front and he's like, well, where, where are the polling booths? And oh. Cam's like. <laughs> <laughs> Cam's like, mate, you're in line for croissants. And he's like, oh, my God, I thought this was the voting. And Cam's like, well, you're here now. You may as well get some oh, croissants. That's amazing. <laughs> Wow. Should be going, I love this one. There's no one telling me how to vote here. Yeah, this exactly. Like, There's no pamphlets being handed yeah. out. It and smells they, great. Looks like they're selling croissants as well. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where, where's the sausage in bread? Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. Incredible. Okay. Yeah. So, so then, I mean, like this, it, 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 what an epic story. But, so you're selling and then at some point, obviously, you're like, well, the, the demand is huge. Yeah. We need to do something. We, we're missing out on a huge segment of people. So I'd left three bags full under Nathan to go and open mm. Loon. Yep. And like Nathan has since told me, he's like, I thought you were crazy. He's like, this girl is going to open a business that just makes croissants. It's going to fail. Right. Like I'll 
sit back and watch, but like this isn't going to be pretty. And this was leaving just to do the Elwood one. That, that's, yeah. yeah, that was the initial. Yeah. So he kind of, he stayed in touch with Cam and I and he was opening Kettle Black down in Albert mm-hmm. Park and he invited us to the opening night and showed us the pastry kitchen upstairs. And like Nathan has incredible reach with commercial property based on his success of cafes. Mm-hmm. And we said to Nathan, look, we're starting to think that we need to move the bakery to a bigger premises because we got to the point where we were annoying more people than we were making happy. And right. like even like we were Cam and, like brother and sister working like 17 hours a day in a kitchen together. We were at maximum capacity. And the, the standard was, why don't you just make more? And we were like, oh my God, hmm. if we could, we would. Like, hmm. don't you think we would prefer to stay open past 8.45 in the morning. Like, so we knew we needed to find a bigger premises and we're like, if anyone knows, Nathan will know. So we said to him, look, if you ever get off at a site and you don't think it's appropriate for something you want to do, but maybe you think it would work for Loon, can you just keep us in mind? He said, oh, it's funny you say that. I signed the lease on an old factory in Fitzroy about six months ago and I'm paying the rent on it, but I don't really know what to do with it. So Nathan just gave us the keys and he's like, look, go and have a look at it. Um, and then the next week he came down to Loon and he sat on the steps next to me while I baked where Oliver Strand sat. So from the New York Times. So the New York so Oliver Strand actually had a croissant from Elwood, not from Fitzroy. Right. And I had no idea who he was at the time. He was brought in by a friend of mine, Matt Perger. Mm-hmm. And they sat and I said, Oh, you're allowed one each. What do you want? And Oliver's like, Oh, oh, I'll have a traditional croissant. And so he literally based his entire review on eating one plain croissant that I handed him while he was sitting on the steps while I was baking. So Nathan came and sat there and he witnessed the whole thing. And then he took Cam and I out for dinner, I don't know, a week later to Town Mouse, which sadly doesn't exist anymore. I think it's one of Melbourne's best. Mm -hmm. And he proposed to us that he buy into the business and help us grow it. And he said that would come with getting the site in Fitzroy. I could help with all of like the council plans and permits and, and fit outs and things like that. So Cam and I decided that we'd take Nathan on board as a minority shareholder and we moved from Elwood to Fitzroy and I guess the rest is somewhat history. Yeah, because so. now now you've got, is it seven locations around Australia? Yeah, we've got five loons, five uh, loons. three in Melbourne, two in Brisbane, um, another small pastry business called Moon, which is just down the road from Loon. In, and in Fitzroy. In Fitzroy. Yeah. And uh, a wine bar up in Brisbane. So, yeah. Incredible. There yeah. is so much to you. <laughs> I feel like whenever <laughs> I go home after an interview, I'll, my wife will say, how was it? And then she'll say, actually, don't tell me. I just want to listen to it. Yeah. I just want to listen to it. I will not be able to hold back on this one. I know. <laughs> She's going to hear it all. <laughs> Amazing. And, 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 not and, the Mr. Chicken bit, but I'll tell you. <laughs> and then from this moment on, like, shame on the person who says, oh, yeah, the croissant lady. It's like, it's just such a bigger story. Like, it's an incredible. Oh, no. Yeah. Can, like, yeah. Does, can I ask, does Sebastian, has Sebastian seen how successful you are? Has Sebastian heard that you are now the number one croissant in the world? Well, I've been back to Paris several times since starting Loon. And whenever I go back, I drop into Dupin. I bet you do. And Sebastian <laughs> always comes out and gives me a hug and says hello to me. Ah, so he, so he does. knows? Does yeah. he know that you won the... Oh, I, I don't think it was It was a, a, an official thing. I mean, I think best croissant in the world is pretty subjective. I'm happy that Oliver Strand thought it. And I would describe it as my favourite croissant, but essentially I've imagined what I would like to eat as a croissant and I've reverse engineered it. So the way we make croissants at Loon is very different to the classic way of making croissants, you know, the, the classic French technique. But um, This is your engineering background that, that taught you to do this though. Well, like I, I had guess. that 90% gap of knowledge that I needed to fill and instead of going back and learning it in an apprenticeship or a course, I thought I'll just figure it out. And because of that, we're not tied to a centuries old technique mm a master baker's handed down to a master baker and so forth. So every single day at Loon, any pastry chef that works on the production of croissants has the ability to affect and change and improve our technique. So it's an ev- like similar to that Noma story, it's an ever-evolving technique that if someone has an idea, we'll trial it. And if it's better than the baseline, like very Formula One, if it's better than the baseline, then that becomes the new baseline. The thing that I feel like we haven't touched on yet, um, which I feel like is the most important thing, is your relationship with perfectionism mm. because to to de- that that few months or three months of recipe testing that you did in Elwood like before you created the croissant 
which of course has evolved. But the, when it started, when you were ready, like when did you feel like, or what was the process of figuring out how to be, how to make it the best? And then when did you know it was enough? Or oh, that's great? a really good question. I think it's never going to be perfect. And that's something that I've had to learn to deal with. But at some point you need to jump in the deep end. And like we, when we started Moon a year and a half ago, I was trying to perfect the product is called a crawler that we sell at Moon. And I was trying to perfect the crawler. And at some point Cam said to me, Katie, you're 90% there. Improvement now will only come from making it at production capacity and l- learning how to improve it and how it how it performs in bigger batches. And like that's why Cam's been so intrinsic to the growth of Loon because he sees he kind of he he curbs I think my perfectionism would have the potential to hold us back because I would just I would make a process longer than it needed to be to get to a level of detail that I would say 99.9% of people wouldn't spot. Mm. Um, and that's not commercially viable for a business. And like Loon Cam coming on board after 18 months allowed me to have someone there to say, Katie, this is actually like already way better than anybody else's. You need to like let that level of detail go because then we can make 20 more a day mm-hmm. or 100 more a day. Mm-hmm. Interesting, um, yeah. I think at some point in time maybe needing to earn some money might have been like, okay, for the last week, you've baked up product that you're happy with. That, like, if I was sitting in a cafe and someone presented that to me, I'd be like, "This is the best croissant I've had in Australia." At some point in time, I need to start making money <laughs> because <Yes. laughs> and sharing I, it with everyone. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So uh, maybe the business needing to perform in some level was a driver for me. I could like. Had it not been for money, I probably could have just kept going and going and going and never actually sold a croissant. Like I might, 10 years later, might still be trying to perfect the plain <laughs> croissant, but I'd be very broke. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and living with mum and dad. <laughs> God, it'd be a good croissant though. <laughs> yeah, God. It, I mean, it, it's it's a fascinating thing when is like, it, it's sort of the classic thing of um, an artist knowing when it's finished. Like when, yeah. is, when, is a, when is a piece of art finished because it is so subjective there's no one uh like i guess even with a formula one car you could you know when it's like finished because it's like oh it's now faster than this other teams yeah it's like but taste well that's definitive isn't it it? like yeah are you winning races okay that's what you need to do yeah Yeah. but But like yeah croissant is just like well it could it be tastier i don't know well that's the that's the best thing about Loon is I, at some point I had to start making it a viable business, but I never had to stop evolving the product. I didn't just settle on a recipe and a technique and go, all right, that's it. Like from, from the day I started selling them, it's been an evolving technique. You know, it would, it would get better or faster or like it would save money, but like always for me, any change for the positive has to either not affect the quality of the product or make it better. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so for me on a daily basis, our plain croissant and everything that comes from that is open to improvement and interpretation. So it, it's where I guess it, a work of art at some point needs to hang on a gallery wall and you have to settle with it. The the plain croissant doesn't. Yeah. So it can be ever evolving. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, it's such a pleasure to meet you, Kate. I'm, I'm oh, gonna, you. We're going to have to wind up because it's been, it's been a long chat and you probably need to go, but it's been so wonderful to meet you. Thank oh. you for sharing your story. Uh, there I was, can't believe we've been talking for this long. It's gone so fast. It's incredible, yeah. yeah. It's, um, yeah, I look forward to watching the movie. <laughs> it, it's, it, it really is just such an incredible story and there's so many components to it, but I do really appreciate how generous you've been with sharing the parts around your mental health uh, because we said before it's almost like a – Eating disorders to me, it's like a stigma on top of a stigma, yep. which which can be really hard to share. So, yep. thank you for being so open with that. Oh, um, you're so welcome. It's I think it's something that we have to normalise talking about. Hmm. Um, maybe if I could just mention one more thing. Um, of course, of course. The thing that I'm so excited about at the moment is I over the last year and throughout lockdown, I actually wrote the first Loon Cookbook. 
I was going to I was going to mention it, but yeah. Sorry. No, 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 I'm glad you are. Yeah, yeah. Um I think for me that was like a return to being very solo in my work and I got to throw myself into re-engineering and rewriting the recipe for the home cook. And um, I won't go into detail because I'd love everybody just to read the story about how I landed upon the recipe that I have. But, um, yeah, I'm incredibly excited now over the mm. coming months to start seeing people sending me, you know, finished products of what they've made Whoa. from the cookbook. So is that is there, I mean, I mean, you're well past that, but is there an element of you going like fearful of sharing the recipe? No, because the way we do it at Loon is not possible to replicate in the home kitchen because nobody in the home kitchen has the commercial bakery equipment that we have. Right. So maybe if I am going to share one thing about the book, the thing that I was really committed to, like say you buy a cookbook and you pick a recipe and you make it and throughout the recipe you're like, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't quite look like what it's supposed to look like. I've done something wrong. That's often, I think, an error in the recipe writer that they haven't provided enough information for your ultimate success in making that product. And I had bad experiences trying to replicate croissants from home home cookbooks when I got back from Paris. And I was like, when I signed the contract with Hardy Grant, I was committed to writing a recipe that the home baker would feel like I was holding their hand throughout the entire process. So the way I have written the recipe is very conversational, but it's also got imagery for every single step next to it. So Beautiful imagery. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's like amazing, yeah. It looks Evio, great. the designer, had that idea to do everything on black and etch it, and it's it's so detailed in its step-by-step. Step. My editor was the first one to try the recipe when I'd fin- finally landed on it, and there was no imagery at the time, and she kept texting me going, it's so easy. Like, should it be this easy? I feel like I should be finding it harder. <laughs> I would assume it would be very hard. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, wow. I've never wanted a croissant more in my entire I life. I know. Same. <laughs> like, everyone listening is like, just started walking in the direction of Loon as like <laughs> subconsciously just heading towards Loon. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I will be eating Loon tomorrow. I, I promise you. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kate. Oh, so nice to meet you both. Well, meet you. See you. Friend of Ryan Shelton. Friend. Very close friend, yes. <laughs> Thanks for having me and for letting me talk about my passions. Pleasure. Yeah. An Pleasure. extraordinary journey. Thank you, Kate. Well, thank you very much to Kate Kate Reid. What an amazing... I mean, what an amazing story. We do say that a lot, but that is... It should be a movie. Yep, I, I agree. I couldn't sleep the night after that interview because I couldn't stop thinking about... It. Your audition. <laughs> 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 who are you playing? Who are you playing? What I'm you playing say? the guy who was at a store at 5 Oh, yeah, of course. It's only one line. It's only one line, but I'm still nervous. <laughs> what, what's the line? Are you open yet? <laughs> Delivered with more. I thought that was pretty good. That was my audition and I've just stopped it. Can you, okay, if we need to do a take two. Okay. Oh, have you got Wi-Fi for my iPad? Oh, not even, different line. Oh, yeah, I thought you wanted a different line. <laughs> oh, no, different performance. Oh. <laughs> but it's good we've got it in the can. Um, can we go another, okay, same, yeah, okay, same cool, line? Cool, cool, so yeah. are you okay, open yeah, yet? Yeah. Just different performance. Okay, yeah. Um, oh, are you open yet? <laughs> <laughs> so much eye work. <laughs> it was, wasn't it? <laughs> so much eye work. That was great. It's good to have some options. <laughs> so you'll call me or do I? Yeah, no, we'll send it through to the casting director. Great, it's okay. out of my hands. You oh, know, good, definitely good. send it to them. Great, thank um, you. Okay, so to talk seriously though, um, so much to, to talk about. Before we go into this, I was thinking, I was very inspired by her wanting to give joy to people when they're eating their pastries. So me and Bridge thought it would be, and Hugh, you haven't eaten enough loon. So Bridge, can you no, please bring something no. to the table? <gasps> no. Oh, I'm got- so happy. <laughs> oh my God. I'm not even joking. Uh, I, I, was, had, I had no idea. I'm not even joking. I was looking at the time before going, will loon still be open? Oh, I am so. So maybe, do you want to describe what just happened? Okay, yes. Sorry, so, Bridge, Bridge, <laughs> Bridge, Bridge has just brought out because, Josh, obviously you're not here. You're in Perth. Oh, gosh. Um, you guys have very kindly organised some loon croissants. Oh. So I believe the selection is uh, un croissant, oui. un pain au chocolat, and un cougie amant. I mean, oh, just oui. look at it. 
Ooh, très bien pronunciation. <laughs> merci, merci. Thank you so much, Josh and Bridge. Incredible. I was going to thank Kate, but I don't. I think we probably paid for them, didn't we? <laughs> we did, yeah. I think we did, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we right. can thank Kate for creating the, yeah. the, the yeah. loon in the yeah. first place. That's Josh brilliant. and Bridge for financing it. And um, wow, that is very exciting. The joy is being spread. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Let's talk. Yeah. I, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk stuff. The, the, I don't know about you guys, but the thing that really stood out to me, and I'm hoping it resonated with you because I've prepared a bit, prepared a bit on it, was perfectionism. Yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. I mean, for this podcast, it's, it's a, it is, she really is the perfect slash imperfect guest for this podcast. Mm, totally. Yeah. I mean, from the outside, a rocket scientist who then creates the greatest pastry in the history of the world. Yeah. Life's going to be pretty good. Yeah. But I, I mean, fascinatingly, I think one of the things that drove her to be so good was obviously her perfectionistic traits. So mm. I think setting yourselves really high standard is one thing, but then letting it dictate when it gets to the point where it takes you over your mental health, that's a problem. So if it's okay with you guys, I want to chat perfectionism for a little bit. Mm. Um, mm. I think very quick, everyone knows kind of what it is. It's where we set ourselves ridiculously high standards. Mm-hmm. Um, and we don't meet those standards. We sort of view ourselves basically as a failure. Mm-hmm. And get really down ourselves. If we, I, if we don't achieve, yeah, yeah. If expert, we don't yeah. meet those standards, yep. we kind of can get really down ourselves. Um, I read fascinatingly a lady called Katie Rasmussen from West Virginia University um, has been researching perfectionism in young people, and she's actually found that now two in five kids and adolescents now have um, perfectionism or perfectionists, which is quite scary. Mm-hmm. Um, it's increasing rapidly. It's thirty three percent more common amongst university students in two thousand and sixteen than it was back in the nineties. So. Mm-hmm. It's just becoming more and more common. I think that's probably got a lot to do with social media and, and the world we live Comparison. in these days. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Well, I mean, it's it, it makes me think of the episode, the chat we had with Oliver Berkman uh, mm. a couple of weeks ago uh, and, he, and how he talks about finitude and the finitude in people and mm. how we are all finite in our ability to do anything, like the expectations we have in ourselves and our jobs or our careers or our partners even. The, it, the thing that we invent in our head can never be lived up to in reality mm. because in reality we're all finite and yep. we, we, we can't do everything and we can't be everything. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that's such a good point. I think what really fascinated me about this whole thing was there's a really scary link between perfectionism and clinical problems such as depression, anxiety, OCD, um, and eating disorders. And I think for a lot of people who struggle with those things, it's hard to you spend a lot of time wondering what, why, why am I like this? And I think it's fascinating that perfectionism can be one of those mm. causes, one of the causes, not the only thing, but it can contribute to it. And I think some people will go, well, I don't know if I'm a perfectionist or not. So I want to talk about what, how do you know if you're a perfectionist? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I want to talk about why possibly people are perfectionists so yep. you can examine your own story. And then just a couple of things you can do which can help you um, – I wouldn't say get rid of it. I think it's always going to be part of who you are, but embrace your imperfections. Yeah, well, I, I guess so. That's kind of the that's kind of the aim to to get people to maybe lower their standards themselves, so they can mm-hmm. hopefully get a you know reduce the symptoms attached to maybe it's anxiety. I think a really common mm-hmm. one for people who are perfectionists have pretty high levels of anxiety. Mm-hmm. It just occurred to me that Ryan, you were talking about Oliver Berkman before, and his thing about the joy of missing out. I think the interesting thing of the joy of imperfection. In, in this case, because when you realize that you can't be perfect, there's a, I think there's a wonderful freeing nature in that you can just have fun with what you're doing, knowing that it will never be perfect. So that pressure's taken off. And then it's just, it's pure joy because it's just play. Mm-hmm. Totally. That's really cool. Mm, yeah. So for people listening, thinking, well, I don't know if I'm a perfectionist. I know I set myself high standards. Here are some things. It was in an article um, in Psych Central um, and the, t- and the heading was, how do you know if you're a perfectionist? Um, and here are some of the things that might be common amongst um, perfectionists. So you're a perfectionist in all things. So it's one thing to, I think a lot of us want to be perfect in our work and we strive for that, but that's kind of, that's just the way we approach work. Mm-hmm. Perfectionism is that it's what you apply to your fitness regime. It's what you apply to conversations you might have with people. It's what you might apply to social situations you find in you find yourself in it might look what well, the way you look it's mm-hmm. it's across all things so does it include like um getting really frustrated if you're late like if you're if you're someone who prides themselves on being like on time or like reliable yeah, reliable yeah. I perfectionist guess. in all things in all things yep okay. yeah yeah 
The second one, um, you're an all or nothing person. Mm. Someone who's very good at going, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it better than anyone, the best I can possibly do. Yeah. Or I'm not even going to touch it because if I just give it a little bit of a nudge, I'm not going to be perfect at it. So, I'm Which is how nothing. Kate describes her time at Formula One yep. and, then at, and then the croissant yep. inventing as well. Yeah. Yep. Uh, another one is you crave approval. So much of what you do is about being recognized by other people and telling you how well you're doing. Mm-hmm. So that's another one. Um, another characteristic would be that feedback makes you defensive. You really struggle uh, yeah. receiving feedback. Yep. So you're always trying to find an excuse or a reason as yeah. opposed to being open-minded to the fact that you might not be perfect yet or you could be wrong. Yeah, yep, totally. Um, you're highly critical of others. So you're very quick to find fault in other people. You may not bring it up to them and tell them to their face, but you're just constantly in your mind finding faults in the people around you. Um, another one is you're a big procrastinator, very good at putting stuff off because when you want something to be perfect, you need to be feeling perfect. You know, to say you're going to write something, mm. that's probably quite common for writers, but if you're not 100% feeling it, you're not going to start writing. Yeah. You have to be a hundred percent feeling like the room's going to be clean. Yes, the the, the sun's going to be in the right place. The window's going to be up, fresh air. My pencil's in the right place. I'll start now. Yeah, your your specific table at the cafe has to be available. Yeah. you have to sit in that seat. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yep. And the last one is you're full of guilt. You feel guilt a lot of areas in your life. How do you mean by that? Like, well, it might be around relationships that you have. Maybe maybe with a person that you. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think of an example from my life. Um, yeah, there's someone who I've just been trying to catch up with for a while and he sent the last message saying we should catch up this week mm. and I haven't been back to him for three days mm. and I'm just, I'm feeling, I don't think I'm a perfectionist, but I f- I'm feeling guilt about that. And I know that he's like, he knows I'm busy. Yeah. He doesn't care if I don't catch up this week, but mm. I'm, I just, I feel this full on guilt about it. So and it's the guilt of not being, not being good at getting back to someone or not being yeah, a good but friend. It could, that, or... that could be, you know, in all areas of life, it could be guilt around, yeah. um, yeah, you know, maybe there's a project you're working on at, at at work that you're responsible for delivering on, and you're it's not going perfectly, and therefore you feel guilty about it. As in, like it has to be perfect, or else things are your fault. Is it possible to be a, like a a lazy <laughs> a lazy perfectionist? Because or a bad perfectionist? Because all of what you just said rings so true to me to the point where it's like it's feeling a bit weird. Like I have guilt as an underlying emotion or feeling. A lot of the, yep. mo- as you probably know, for a lot of the day, yep. in mm-hmm. I'll do my best to be good to everyone, and especially in my relationship. But I still find it very hard to get rid of any. Like I can do, uh, look after the kids all day uh, on on a weekend to sort of, um, you know, do the favour so I can get one back and have a day where I go and do something. And I find it very hard to not feel guilty for the whole time when I'm away. I procrastinate so well. <laughs> I've been an amazing procrastinator my whole life. Would you say you're perfect at it? <laughs> yeah. That's probably the closest thing. If I'm perfect at something, it's that. Um, <laughs> I, like I've written a lot of music and I would never show it to anyone and hide it from people. I don't want to put it online and I don't want anyone to know because it's not perfect. I've got this idea that one day after I've written enough and I've made enough, I can just burst onto the scene as a perfect musician that's fully formed mm. and has it all, that's this great <laughs> song. Um, yeah. It's just, I cannot believe how much of what you just said resonates with me, but I, I think it would be laughable to most people who know a lot of my friends because they would be like, Phew, Josh is far from perfect. He's quite messy. He does like, he does all, all the things that are the opposite of that, but I feel like they're all in an attempt to achieve those things. Does that make sense? I'm actually blown away by how true that statement is what you just said I'm looking at the lo- the list here I've never seen you as a perfectionist not in a not in a bad way mm. but I'm looking at that list and yeah it's every single one of them yeah I uh, I don't think you crave approval um I think I do to a degree like I certainly from certain people there are certain people in my life that I I think I've suffered from probably pretty low self esteem throughout my life to a point where I needed the approval of others to um, booster up that self-esteem, but I think it's in certainly in, it's only in certain areas of my life, if that makes sense. Like some areas I've got high self-esteem, others I've got very low self-esteem. Yeah. yeah. But how, how does, so how does that, how, where does that fit in? Like if Josh is like resonating with that list enormously like that, but he doesn't necessarily feel like he's a perfectionist, 
how like like I, I think Kate. It sounds like Kate would identify as someone who is in the past at least has been like a perfectionist with these like in in huge huge um, unattainable expectations of of perfection that maybe she's got to the other side of and even even she said the loon croissant is it will never be perfect even even though probably at a time in her life she was like I'm not selling I'm not going to sell this to the public until I've got this perfect croissant mm. but she now has em- embraced the fact that it will never be perfect it's always evolving which is incredible and that's that's like such a great yeah. metaphor for for life really that mm. it, it's constantly evolving it can always be improved um, and it will never be perfect because perfect means I guess it cannot evolve anymore mm. it cannot get any better mm. which seems which which is kind of when you think about it in terms of it like that it's like it seems laughable because everything can always be a bit mm. better or changed or evolved because the environment maybe changes or and also perfect seems such a, it's such a broad term mm. it, it could be there's so many like by what measure mm. But the interesting thing, and now I'm just really making this all about me. <laughs> Sorry to everyone. No, but no, please. The, the interesting thing I found listening to Kate, especially when she's talking about, well, spending three months to come up with what is the perfect croissant and her time at um, Williams, I look at that and I'm so envious and jealous of her um, ability to continue on the task through I don't know how many in her mind would have been failures along the way so far from a perfect wing on the car or so far from the perfect croissant. I, every time I fail when I'm trying to do something, it's confirmation that you don't know what you're doing. And I find it very hard to go back and do it again. It's just a, oh, yeah, you're shit at that. And it's something I've had to really Mm -hmm. work very hard at to go, no, no, failure is part of the process. There's an absolutely brilliant, one of the best audio books I've ever listened to is Malcolm Gladwell's interviews with Paul Simon. Um, Mm. And there's a quote from Paul Simon in that where he um, says, um, failure is, I'll paraphrase because it's definitely not exactly, but um, failure is just more information. So he talks about how he spent months and months and months trying to convince this, I think it was a French, very weird exotic instrument and the best player of it in the world to play on a a song. And he went over there, recorded and it was terrible, like it didn't work, sounded shocking. Um, and the whole thing just, it was an enjoyable experience, but it was never going to work for what he wanted. And he said, there's no point getting down about it. That's just more information and you're closer to the solution. That's awesome. It's unreal. Yeah. And I've, or, and I, that was a great quote to hear. And I'm trying so hard to incorporate that attitude into my life. And it sounds like Kate must have an ability to just go, no, failure is more information. And I can keep going and keep going. Both of you had said stuff which is much better than what I'd planned to say. So that's, I'm so glad you <laughs> No, please in. say say. Well, I just all I wanted to do now is just quickly talk about why why possibly perfectionism might exist for someone if they're just think if they've listened to that list like Josh. Now, Josh, I, I knowing what I'm about to read out, I don't actually know how any of these would have impacted you to be to tick all those boxes. But um, well, maybe I'm not. I, I think it's just yeah. something I I need to go and see Maria again. I've been wanting to go back to my psychologist for a while. And I'd love to just chat to her about this. And yeah, I was going to say, does that Roadcaster Pro have a direct line to Doctor M? <laughs> oh God, well, <laughs> M, yeah. M, we need you. We need you. It's like a bat, <laughs> yeah. bat signal. Yeah, um, <laughs> because I'd love to ask you that question as well. But um, just for for people who want to know potentially why they find themselves ticking those boxes of being a perfectionist, um, here is a perfectionism is often present when some combination of these factors exist. You had rigid high parental expectations. You had highly critical shaming or abusive parents. You had, and this is kind of the opposite of this, but you had excessive praise for your achievements, if that kind of makes sense. Like that's what you'd really get off on knowing how well you're doing. Yeah, and then I guess the flip side of that is if you don't get the praise, then you feel like you're a failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Low self-esteem or feeling inadequate. Believing your self-worth is determined by your achievements. You put in significant effort to feel in control at all times. You feel the weight of cultural expectations. So it doesn't have to be all of those, but there are some common things that can can cool. contribute towards someone being perfectionist. Mm. Yeah, the parent stuff doesn't really resonate, but the latter stuff definitely does. Mm. That's interesting. As in you're, you feel your self-worth is determined by your achievements? Yeah. I mean, it was funny. If we were having this exact discussion before the mics were on when you were out of the room with Bridge, that uh, our producer, that when – 
having run my own business for 10 years before this, when work wasn't coming in mm. and I had a bit of quiet yep. time, yeah. I was never really stressed about money, but I was always felt like my self-worth went down with the amount of, so if people didn't need me to be doing a job, so it wasn't so much achievements and like winning awards or anything, because that never came my way, but just the achievement of having someone want me to do work for them. Um, and if that wasn't there, then I, my self-worth was pretty low as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I definitely, I definitely r- relate to that as well. It's just like, you know, if you're, it's so, it's so easy and I think probably pretty normal to get sucked into the thing you're doing right now and like being judged by the person, what you're doing or who you are at this moment in your life, as opposed to, I don't know, when I think about, like when I think about other people in trying to put myself in other people's shoes thinking about me i don't i don't think about other people as like well i judge their entire Mm. identity based on how they're going right now like i don't do that (laughs) about anyone (laughs) you think about all the things they've done like i'm not thinking about you know if someone's not working a lot at the moment i'm not like rolling my eyes and thinking actually i don't like them (laughs) yeah or not even i don't like them but i don't respect them i don't think they're a talented Mm. person or they've got a lot to offer you think about like oh they're incredible they've done this they've done that they've They've got, you know, they're so great to hang out with. You think about the entire yeah. person and their entire yeah. life. But when we think about it from ourselves, we, I mean, I, I, I get so wrapped up in the thing I'm doing now and I'm mm. only, my self-worth and my, my uh, achievements or, um, yeah, I guess my identity is based on the thing that I'm, or the last thing I did or mm. the thing I'm doing next. Mm. Because it's that dreaded question of when people say, and dep- and it's only dreaded if you're at a, depending on the time of your time of your life that you're in but that dreaded question which can be like what are you up to at the moment mm. like oh how's work going and if you're not doing anything at work at that particular point in time you feel like worthless mm. even though mm. you might have done years of stuff that that person might be so admirable of yeah but yeah. you don't think so about true. that so to round this out just some of the ways to help people who suffer from perfectionism um, the overarching theme here is just to practice self-compassion, which sounds like a bit of a token thing to say, but um, I'll give you a couple of ways that you might be able to do this. And there's, a, there's so much online if you want to go and look this up, but here are the things that really stood out to me, four really practical things you can do. So number one, again, this is going to sound token, but focus on the positives. What I mean by that is if you, let's say it's a work project that you're working on and you're, you're people who are perfectionists are so focused on the negative. So whatever they've just done, how is it not perfect? And they won't often sit back and reflect on all the stuff that they did do well. I think about when I was a primary school teacher, we would get given a piece of writing by, you know, I had grade five kids, so 11-year-olds, they'd give me a piece of paper with a whole paper full of writing and my job is to find the mistakes for them. You'd circle all the mm-hmm. mistakes and give it back to them. But what I'd often do as a teacher was I'd give it back and say there are, yeah, four mistakes here. And I'd go, but just so you know, you've probably made about 500 correct decisions on this page. Like you've done 500 things really well. Like we go, there's four mistakes. Like, there's 500 words spelt perfectly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but we only, but as kids growing up, teachers, their job is to try and help us get better. So they'll go, here's where you went wrong. Yep. Fix it next time. Not just, and this is not just a message to primary school teachers, but for all of us, in a piece of work you've done, there might be three or four mistakes, but you've probably made a thousand <laughs> correct decisions along mm, the way. I love it. So just That's circle really the good. positives. And I don't mean literally go through on a page, but just have a think about what have I done really well here? Yeah. Um, and often it was just, I remember I used to use a green pen for, you know, teachers use a red pen for making corrections. I started using a green pen because oh. I just felt it was like, it's not a bad thing. You just made three mistakes. It's amazing. Well done. Yeah. The red pen is so negative, isn't it's it? It's very general. I don't know. And other teachers probably do the same. So you're the reason why Bic continued the four color pen. <laughs> Like, <laughs> you must be the only one Possibly. using the green. Because <laughs> there must have been years where they're like, yeah. surely, guys, this is the year where we change it to a three-color pen. No one's using the green. It's like, no, well, according to the data here, there's, there's a guy in Bourne. guy in Bourne in Victoria is using the shit out of that green. <laughs> so that's the first one. The second one... Um, is, again, a token comment, but I'll follow something more practical. Allow yourself to make mistakes. So that sounds like a bit of a throwaway line, but I'll give you an example. I went mountain bike riding for the first time I left on the weekend with a group of guys. And 10 minutes, I thought mountain biking ride was just riding a bike with slightly bigger wheels and <laughs> yeah. maybe on a bit of gravel and you go over some 
I had no idea how hard it was. The we downhill had, mountain biking? The downhill mountain yeah. biking at pace. Terrifying. Or going up the hill, incredibly hard as well. Yeah. Both of them just awful. And we had three dives straight of it. Ten minutes in, I stopped because everyone disappeared and I couldn't – everyone was gone. Yeah. That was so fast. The guy, another guy that I went with, he's never done it before, but he was gone. He was so fast, just took off. <laughs> and one of the guides who's with us is just behind me. And I think he was a bit flummoxed by how bad I was, but he was very nice. And he goes, I might just <laughs> – Flummoxed. <laughs> I haven't said flummoxed in a while. Tick that off the uh, uh, <laughs> list of words to use on the show. Anyway, he he actually he had to go. Hey, we might just call ahead and just get everyone. He got the walkie-talkie out, and it's a walkie-talkie. Had to get everyone to wait for me because they didn't know where we didn't know where they'd gone because I was so slow. Yeah, and I had three days this, and ten minutes in, I thought I don't think I'm gonna do this. I think I might go for a couple of runs because I like doing that. I'm really good at that. I'll go for a couple of runs and I'll read books by the fire and wait for the guys to get mm. back every single day. But I did. He goes, just give me that. Just do it for another hour and watch how much you improve in an hour. I made mild improvements, not too much, but it was enough. That I had this feeling of like, oh, I'm terrible at this and that's okay, but it's going to be fun to learn to get much better at it. Now, mm. it still wasn't great by the end of three mm. days, but I was a lot better. And I made so many mistakes, so many areas. I learned so much. And it's kind of like a reminder of like, it's like you have to make mistakes. Yeah. You just have to make mistakes. You do it, otherwise, you will never improve. That's information. Yeah, it's information. I had so, I, made, I had so much information on the weekend. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think try something new and enjoy the learning curve you go and remind yourself that that learning curve still exists for you at the thing that you do every single day if you really embrace mistakes, if you really embrace them yeah. rather than try and avoid them the whole time to be perfect. Love it. The third one, very practical one, get therapy. Mm-hmm. I had a session with my psychologist this morning, first one I've had since February. I just cannot believe I've gone without it for, for all this time. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't about perfectionism, but they just therapists are just so good with this stuff. Brilliant. Um, and I reckon perfectionism is something they see a lot of. Mm-hmm. And the final thing, it kind of links to what you just said, Josh, but before, but I, I just think, let's just remember that perfect doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. There's actually no such thing as perfect. So what you are trying to achieve, it doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Remind yourself of that. Yeah. I mean, so much of it would come from, I imagine the way that we compare ourselves to other people and mm. the perceived perce- the perceived yeah. perfection in other people. Yeah, that person's life is perfect, so I need to get that as well. So yeah. it, they're not, their life is not perfect. In fact, the more perfect they make it look online, I'd argue that it's, there's probably more Bless. going on. <laughs> so anyway, this has been a long section, but I, I just I think it's an important one because I think so many people struggle with perfectionism and it's causing issues that – well, people who might experience depression or anxiety or those kind of things are thinking, where is this coming from? perfectionism might be playing a part and something you might want to address. Well, it's, I mean, like it is weirdly, it's something that we don't get a chance to talk about specifically mm. on this podcast, which is perfection. Yeah. Considering the name of the podcast. <laughs> mm. It's taken us 70 episodes to get there. I know. <laughs> but uh, I mean, here have, we are. We have spoken for a while, but I, I think like, you know, give us a break. It's yeah, perfection. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. On perfectionism. I also think it's also the, it sort of leads into a little bit of something I just want to bring up very quickly, which was the, mm. that there's no perfect life either or perfect person. And I look at someone like Kate, it's, she certainly seems perfect from the outside if you look at her career on paper. Um, but I thought it was, I've always been obsessed or for a lot of my life, I was sort of obsessed with the idea of the self-made person and this perfect person that just achieves it all. And I always kind of wanted to be that. I wanted that story for myself. And I think if you look at Kate and listen to the way she speaks about the people who helped her along the way, I think it's just so powerful to think of people like Mary and Allen, um, who gave her a, um, a chance, the owner of the Boulangerie. I was so moved by the kindness and acts of other, of people to help her along the way, but also her admission later on with when she was talking about her brother Cam, that she, if it was just her, Loon would never have been mm. what it is. It would never have grown to what it is because she would have been obsessed with making that perfect croissant. So mm-hmm. I think a the lesson to work with other people and lean on other people to help you along the way in whatever you're doing. And also how a little act of kindness, like giving someone a, a, a job at a cafe that you own or like a, that kind of thing, how life-changing that can be to someone. I was really moved by that part of the story. Mm. Well, totally so, agree. Yep. Totally agree. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Well, before we go, we have a very big announcement. Well, well we don't have the announcement now. No. Well, so this is a, this is a mildly... We're announcing the announcement? Yeah. 
<laughs> we're having a special episode on Friday. Yeah, we don't usually re- release episodes on Fridays. It's very rare that we do. Yeah, so we have a special announcement on Friday. Yeah. And this is an announcement letting you know of that announcement. So it's like it's like when movies release trailers for the trailer. This yeah. is like we have an announcement on Friday. So this is the official announcement that we will be making an announcement yeah. on Friday. Um, but we, we are. It's something, it's, it's something exciting that we're, we're going to be doing soon and um, we can't wait to talk to you guys about it. On, on That's Friday, all we're saying Friday. about it? Yeah. That's all we're saying at this point. Great. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Any clues? No, nah, no clues. Okay. Well, mainly because I really want to eat these croissants. Oh, yeah. Cool. Okay. <laughs> See you on Friday, guys. Uh, <laughs> huge thank you to Kate Reid. If you are in Melbourne, Brisbane or Sydney, um, go to Loon. You'll make yourself very happy. And yeah. sh- please show Kate how happy you are when you eat that croissant. Yep. <laughs> cool. We'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. See you, guys. Bye. Josh, it's Ryan. Um, I usually call Hugh after the show, but I wanted to call you um, for, for two reasons, actually. One, just to, to thank you so much for those croissants you organised during the show. That was very thoughtful. And uh, two, uh, it's, a, it's a bit embarrassing, uh, but after the show I went to Loon because I wanted to buy some more croissants, right? Uh, they, were, they were so good. But Loon was closed, so... And this is embarrassing. I'm not proud of this, but I broke in to Loon and now I'm sitting here by myself and I've eaten about 60 croissants. That's a lie. It's closer to 100. And Josh, I can't move, mate. I can't move and I'm scared. Okay? I mean, is there a pastry emergency line or or something? I just don't know what to do. I'm just worried they're going to have to tie me to the top of the ambulance like Mr. Chicken. Just call me, please. It's Ryan, by the way. Ryan Chilton from the, from the podcast, The Imperfects. Call back. Press 2-2 two, two. to reply message. Press 1 to reply. If this episode has been triggering for you, we strongly recommend Lifeline on 131114. The Imperfects is hosted and co-produced by Hugh Van Kylenberg, Ryan Shelton and Josh Van Kylenberg. This episode was produced by Bridget Northeast, filmed by Andy Poole and edited by George Martin. A special thanks to Dr M for her expertise and guidance. We'd also like to thank the Resilience Project for their ongoing support. Like you would never dare.